am your host, Jason Miles, and welcome to another episode of This is Revolution Podcast. Thank you all for joining us this evening. Before we start, if you're new to the channel, please hit subscribe. Don't forget to hit that notification bell so you are alerted whenever we go live. We're constantly doing cross streams with other channels and adding new shows. Just last night, we did our 14th episode of our leftist sports show, Beyond the Red Zone, with Mac and Marcus of the Left Flank Vets. Also, if you would further like to support the channel for our patrons, we have the exclusive Champagne Room, where we have more zany, uncensored fun, usually watching some weird movies um, that gets the show demonetized like it did this past Saturday. Uh, also, you get to join us for our movie nights, which I decided we're going to add an additional, more fun movie night on my birthday. <clears throat> I haven't decided exactly what movie we'll be watching on my birthday, which is August 19th. Uh, maybe Ninja 3 nomination? <laughs> <laughs> it's my favorite movie because it is part Flashdance, part The Exorcist, and then a ninja movie all rolled into one. So we're going to have multiple movie nights. One movie night that will generally be picked by Pascal Robert it will be an educational film. It'll be a film that we'll, we'll have a great conversation about afterwards. And then another night, we'll have a real fun movie night. We'll just get to joke around, talk shit all night. Sounds like fun. So patreon.com slash bitterlake presents. And for as low as $30, you can join in the fun. That being said, let me bring in my co-host, my homie, my dog. He is the Pascal Robert. Peace and greetings to the chat. Peace and greetings to the audience. Peace and greetings to Jason Miles. And uh, I've been forgetting to introduce this next person, mainly because they're a woman. <laughs> and that is uh, our moderator extraordinaire. I shouldn't say that. She's, she's part moderator. She's part producer. Now she's actually even creating some content for you guys. She actually has created this really awesome show calendar where you guys can actually see the shows for the month so hopefully we'll be getting that up soon for you guys please welcome you may know her from her work on shows like the majority report uh who else are you a moderator for tucson champagne sharks david feldman uh damn there's more i've been delinquent just really not not modding enough there's a couple but more. I got a couple of wrenches. She 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 is the epitome of leftist best. It is the M <laughs> Tucson. Hello. Hello everyone. I just want to say free AOC. <laughs> <laughs> you okay, you went there early. Do for the culture. Okay, you went there early. I I have <laughs> So I'm getting ready for the show, actually, and I'm, I'm, uh, I sent you guys the login stuff, send it to Mello, and I'm waiting, and I'm doing what we always do when we're waiting for bullshit. I'm dicking around on Facebook as old, relevant people do. I'm dicking around on Facebook. A friend of mine who's eh, kind of he's like your libertarian-esque friend, right? He's got a picture of AOC. In the front with cuffs and in the back, he's got a picture of her, but it's a screen grab of right before they cuff her. So you can see they're holding her, about to put cuffs on, but they're not. And he's like, this is real and this is fake or whatever. And I was like, she's getting arrested for a protest. That's what people that do protests do. They're, they're trying to get arrested. And I'm seeing a lot of shit around her being a, a poser uh, for this. Um, what say you, Pascal? I'm just learning about this right now. I mean... Was she protesting some kind of uh, abortion type of act? Was this an abortion action or something like that? I don't, I don't know. M2 Sant was telling us something about a cock carousel. No. Oh, she oh was, was that an off air conversation? <laughs> well, now it's on air, right? <laughs> 17 Democratic lawmakers arrested outside the Supreme Court during abortion rights protests. A number of Democratic representatives, including members of the squad, 
and House leadership were arrested outside the Supreme Court on Tuesday afternoon for pressing, press, for protesting the recent decision to overturn Roe v. Wade. Representatives Atalia Cortez and Catherine Clark of Massachusetts were among those arrested for blocking traffic. Clark served as the assistant speaker and the number four person in the Democratic leadership. Um, I, sure. I didn't, it seemed like something very, at this point, you know, it's definitely not 1963 with the dogs and the water hoses. You know, it's to prove a point, make a spectacle. Uh, yeah. I mean, sometimes you know. <laughs> sometimes the point is to overwhelm the jail system. Because <laughs> there's so many people that you're arresting, they won't know what to do with you. Oh, they'll know they what to do with you. Make a problem. <laughs> I would be surprised. <laughs> I would. I think I would. JB says the squad and he has the copyright thing. The greatest thing that ever happened to those people was Donald Trump calling him that. They, did, they wouldn't have a name before. That's probably true. Yeah, it, probably. He what knows they gonna branding. Call this? Freedom for. He knows branding. Ladies of liberation. <laughs> yeah. <okay. laughs> Melos is a fantastic four. It would have been some. I know I'm Mr. Fantastic. The bald one has to be the thing. Uh. Oof. <laughs> <laughs> just put that one right in. No hetero. Wow. Ooh, child, child, child. If she watches this show and was to respond back to me, then I would look at that as a bit of a feather in the old cap. Can I address the statement that you made that you were like, hey, um, was that an off air thing? Mm -hmm. I just want to give context to that. So we were talking off. Pascal's like, no, you my lawyer. Are you saying no, don't do it? <laughs> okay. My, my lawyer said no. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. Look, okay, how about this? In the mm -hmm. champagne room, there's a couple things I kind of want to address. And I'm, I think one of them might be an off-air thing that I think we should address. But I definitely think we should address the cock carousel. We'll, we'll do that. It sounds so animated. For several reasons. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I mean. Valid ones. Valid ones. Yeah. How does one get on the cock carousel? <laughs> Why are we even talking about it? I'm intrigued. What does it look like? Where is it? <laughs> are they everywhere? Is it one specific location? Is it like Disneyland? Champagne every night. <laughs> what what are you having? Is it a top shelf scotch? Is it a beer? That's exactly what you sound like. Because <laughs> I, I want to know what the cock carousel is. So M Tucson, so if you guys are interested in what the cock carousel is, how one rides one, what is the proper etiquette? Uh is there saddles involved? We will be having this conversation Oof. in the champagne room. I hope so too. Um, uh, our guest hopes that their mom is not watching. Um, <laughs> if your mother is faint of heart, then uh, she should not go to the champagne room. But this show, the main show, good, clean, and wholesome. Is this <laughs> right? I'm going to crash. Used to be. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I do want to bring this up before we bring in our guest real quick. Did you guys know that tomorrow is the two-year anniversary of the passing of Michael Brooks? That is correct. That is correct. Uh, I will actually be doing Left Reckoning tomorrow. Oh, nice. Oh, word? Yeah. You got to keep us posted, man. You're bouncing, doing all these. You know, no. I always tell you beforehand. Before I go and do anything, I'm like, hey, got invited to do this. So I'm like, oh, okay, no problem. You're just like, oh, I'll be there tomorrow. I'm like, my man. Like, no I mean, thing. I usually do small. I'll, I'll, like, I'll get a call and be like, hey, I got a music podcast. Do you want to get on here and talk about why you hate grunge? Okay. Um, sure Pascal is like uh, the biggest people in the left podcast sphere want me to come on and talk about black politics. 
That's Pascal. <laughs> no one wants to talk to me about anything serious. They're like, hey, Jason, you made some dick jokes two weeks ago. Can you come tell them on our show? <laughs> That's untrue. Jason's video essays have been very popular amongst many serious left media spaces. They use that as the glue for the dick jokes. I was thinking about watching some Michael Brooks past episodes. Yeah. I actually, you know, actually, this is kind of, I'm being totally serious. Um, Randomly, because, you know, uh, I think Leisha handles his, the Michael Brooks legacy project thing. Mm -hmm. And um, she, she had posted something he had done, of course, years ago. And I found myself watching it and, and remembering why I really dug that dude, why I was a patron, why when I was in New York on tour, <clears throat> I'd actually called up the show and, and, and when we thought we were going to be in Brooklyn before some stuff got all effed up, um, I was making arrangements to actually go go meet him and David in the studio when they were still uh, doing stuff in the in the Majority Report studio. And... Uh, I was I was I was really sad, man. It it made me it just brought me down. A lot of the small conflicts that we see in this left podcast sphere that kind of spill out and really become demarcating lines for people. I think when he was around, I don't know if all that stuff really would have happened. Um, I feel that way. I don't know if you guys feel that same way. So I don't know if he would have been able to stop it, but I think he would have called it out more effectively for what it is. Yes. Is I, I think yes. some people would think twice mm-hmm. before doing certain things. I think so. Yeah. I think so. And I think he was on his way to becoming um, Huge. a really, a really large, powerful, loud voice. So. And worldwide. We'll be talking about uh, that. Actually, I used a clip of Michael Brooks in one of my video essays, uh, We Don't Need Another Hero. And uh, we're gonna actually going to talk about that video essay with uh, with David and, and Matt. And and, uh, uh, and then this morning, <clears throat> excuse me, to Ray Reed and I were guests on Ben Burgess's show where we what? pretty much make fun of him for about an hour and a half and then talk about a movie that we all watched. But it's just us. Okay. It's it's a good time. So if you're a patron of the Ben Burgess, give them an argument. Uh, I, I think you'll probably get it first. Um, I don't know when he's going to release it, but uh, we laughed for two hours straight. So just know it's a very ser- silly conversation. But Teray upped us to the fact that the movie uh, uh, Hills Have Eyes, the remake. You don't watch horror movies, right, Toussaint? Nope, sure don't. And Pascal doesn't. Uh, is a movie about uh, uh, the fallout from the Iraq War. Really? Oh, he always finds kind of a deeper, a deeper uh, road to go down with some of these silly movies we watch, and uh, and then in August we're going to talk about Blade. Is- oh, I like Blade. Maybe I'll join you for that one. <laughs> wow. You should just rappel down. <laughs> <laughs> and you're supposed to go on uh, another show as well, right, Pascal? You're still waiting for that conference. I'm waiting to hear from that for the scheduling, but I'm sure it'll happen because, you know, that person is creative in terms of you know, <laughs> <laughs> both things. <laughs> and we'll just leave it at that. And Gene Bajlan. Is uh, going to be on the uh, Varn vlog with Derek Varn. Oh, that's right. I'm looking forward to that one. And if you guys haven't watched it, Kuba did a great two hour uh, uh, Abe special with Doug Lane on Sublation Media. So definitely check that out. Yo, man, Kuba talked about every aspect. I mean, I was like, yo, are you going to talk about how they make sushi? Every aspect of Jap. I mean, he left no stone uncovered about Jap- Japanese history in that well, two hour. Also- Cuba learned a term while we were in New York. I law. So, okay. We can talk about that with Tucson's cock carousel. It's not my cock carousel. <laughs> Why would you say that? Uh, you're he the one that's going to be on Less Reckoning tomorrow as well. 
Cuba, 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 uh, Nizneski, Deep State Cuba. Dan Mello's like, who the fuck is talking about what? <laughs> the who that lifted what? <laughs> Gene Bajlan says he will also be on Left Reckoning, but he won't be on my segment because there can only be one man with a hairy chest. Mm-hmm. Glad y'all aren't comparing hair because Gene got you there, buddy. He does, but I'm trying to get my taco meat game up because I watched Rocky one the other day, and when Apollo came out with that taco meat, I was like, that's the goal, <laughs> buff-ass taco meat. This is Taco Meat Podcast. <laughs> taco Meat Tuesday. You guys know what it is. <laughs> you already know what it is. You'd be surprised how many people want to crack. So that being said. I'm so spoiled. <laughs> <laughs> we often speak about the reserve army of labor, but what does that mean? What role historically has U.S. immigration policy played into the creation of that cohort? Well, we're bringing in the author of one of our favorite books and Amazon's best-selling immigration book under 400 pages that wasn't by a Chomsky. <laughs> Please welcome, coming all the way live from a secret bunker somewhere in the southeast, Dan Mello! <laughs> hey, everybody. Dan Mello, you're showing, you're showing way more skin than we were ready to see already. Bro. I'm just making up for, you know, some promises that were broken about Sublation's launch and there being certain gentlemen on this podcast who were going to be in very tight clothing that I didn't see happen, but that's okay. That's all right. That's okay. That's all right. Woo! Mm. Bro, I don't My shorts weren't tight enough? Um, I was going to say they weren't short enough, but hey, let's Thank go with you. that too. Thank you. Okay, well. I, I thought I thought we were getting our Yacht Rock shorts on, but, you know, okay. apparently you know not. What? You guys you guys keep on you keep on asking for for the the bull you're going to get the horns. So listen, Dan, I know that we can go deep dish diving into this immigration thing, but I actually read your piece in Submission about hope okay. and the actual lack of utility of having too much of it. And I'd like to touch on it before we get too deep into the immigration thing, if that's all right with you and Jason, only because yeah. I, too, find this whole, oh, we have to keep hope alive, we have to have hope, let's stay hopeful, rhetoric without any kind of plan of action, somewhat vapid. But can you summarize what your position is for us in your piece, discussing about how the left is oftentimes trapped with you know hope without a plan which is just a wish <laughs> that's actually i wish i hadn't <laughs> i wish i had thought of that line that's a really nice line. damn um damn i should have co-wrote that with you pascal no um yeah i just find and again i you know went back a little ways and i think like there is that that sense of hopelessness on the left like in the post rural world you sort of just saw this like momentary collapse yet again about you know whatever crisis we have this week, right? And I find hope to be that kind of um, that kind of smokescreen, that kind of sort of vain wish, right? That it's like, well, we'll get them next time. Well, if we just keep plodding along, right? We can get past this. We just have to keep hope alive. And it's like, at the end of the day, I think hope hope is um, there's nothing like scientific about hope. There's nothing really even like fundamentally um, um, material really to it, other than the fact that it's it serves as this like ideological blockade for for thinking about what really just needs to happen next, right? Um, and so I, I find hope to to ultimately sort of detract from the greater question of what do we do now? Um, and in this sense. I don't think we need it, right? You don't need it to take the next big step, right? Or even the small step. And I think that in that sense, hope projects forward of like, well, we really want to be certain that whatever we do is going to have the outcome we want, right? That that this change or that change, this approach or that approach is going to get us to socialism, right? But, you know, on the left, I think as leftists, right, if, if Marx's writings and everything that's fallen there from, um, if we believe that in any way as true, right? The question of a transition beyond capitalism isn't a question of if, it's just a question of when, right? 
Um, and so in that sense, I think that we can sort of jettison this need for certainty that we might see socialism in our lifetime, that communism is just around the corner. If we just figure out what, you know, what we need to pull together to, to launch the revolution and instead a, just accept that maybe there's just a small part for us to play in the here and now moving, having that historical movement, that dialectical movement from this moment to the next one. And hope just isn't a required part of that in any way. Do you think hope is used by the left as a means, as a remedy to despair? Yeah, I think it 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 feels good, right? Like it's like, and and you know, even our culture, our films, it's like all of that stuff. It feels good, right? It's a balm. It's a really good balm for that sense of despair around again whatever new crisis there is in our in our current historical moment. Um, but it's ultimately a wish, right? That things were not the way that they are. A wish for a different kind of present rather than just acknowledging that like, there's not some alternate place that we are gonna launch our politics from. It is right here, right now. And the only thing for us to do is just take that next step. Do you, do you think that part of the problem that we have in terms of the way we frame these realities is as Jason says so eloquently, we're all looking for a savior or a hero. Yeah, I mean, it's if if it's not, um, you know, looking at actual individuals, it's looking to institutions, right? Like everyone expected, you know, the Supreme Court to quote do the right thing in X, Y, or Z situation, and then of course everyone is either in one camp of like disappointed but not surprised that they didn't or um, alternatively outraged, right? Because they lied, you know, during their tests. It's like, why are we looking to these bourgeois institutions to deliver, you know, something beyond capitalism? It's, it's always going to reinforce the status quo. There's never going to be something past that, right? So we're deluding ourselves if we expect to make other than any kind of marginal gains. And I say all this is, I'm not an accelerationist, but what I say all of this as, as someone who just firmly believes, right? That it's like, all we can, all we can know, we, there's no certainty about what those institutions will or will not deliver in the future. We just have to keep working at what we have in front of us. Well, I mean, isn't that the real problem though? The, I, I, you know, let me rephrase that. I don't want to say it's a problem. It's just the growing pains of a very young left. And I and I don't really like the framing when people try to say the left really started to blow up or grow up or become what it is with Occupy, because that's a real that was a real mixed bag. You had a lot of anarchists and there's probably more anti vaxxers in there than maybe, you know, socialists, right? Um Bernie Sanders 2015, in my opinion, is really where people start to say the word socialism and feel comfortable again saying it, because now we're we're really moving on. There's a new generation of people that literally did not grow up in Cold War America. They didn't grow up with all the propaganda being shoved down their throat constantly, and they didn't grow up under the fear of some sort of nuclear war. So all they're growing up under is kind of the letdown of institutions. Um <laughs> the president's yeah. failed you probably if you come from a major metropolitan area, your mayor, governor has probably failed you. Um, and there is no social safety net to catch you. You probably don't even really understand what a social safety net is because everything around you has been so privatized. Um, if you're a young person that even went to uh, charter schools. Um, so it seems like this idea that people will save us, which is to me a very American idea it's a very capitalist idea it's an extremely you know to calls it a fat a fascistic idea that's why he doesn't like the the marvel movies um opposed to the to the comics um how do we start to shift away from getting you know, the technocratic solutions thinking beyond liberal democracy and I asked this question to to the to the entire panel and even to you guys in the chat. How do we start to make this transition? Because you wrote this great book about immigration that really put a lot out there that I don't think people think about. We had a show with uh, with the wonderful uh, Jessica San Luis talking about uh, 
immigration and, and a lot of things people didn't necessarily know about policies. Um, part of the failures of Trump, I think he has two major failures, COVID and kids in cages. Even though kids in cages isn't his, it's exploited yeah. on his watch and it doesn't help with his rhetoric of murderers, rapists, build a wall, blah, blah. So how how do we you know I'll I'll start with uh, with Dan and then I ask Pascal that same question. So how do we make this this shift away from good guys and technical solutions? It's tough, um, I think, to you know drop that mindset entirely. But I think even just being in spaces like this, right, where we're talking about political education, where we're talking about looking at because you know I, I totally agree with your assessment, right, of sort of like you know, what Bernie Sand, like a Bernie Sanders or a Corbyn character offered, you know, to, you know, a much more popular left movement. But I think at the same time, right, it's like those policies were really nice to hear coming from an individual. And it was great, you know, I guess for individuals, it felt good, right, to be able to deposit all of that in an individual because they're the ones doing the work then, right? Like you give money, you might show up to some rallies, you know, go out, try to, you know, froth up a few votes, but that's the end of the work, right? Like that's once, and then once they're there, that's that. Um, and I think that the other work of really trying to pick apart how the institutions are failing, understanding how capitalism plays a role in all of this, the bigger work, right, of education, of trying to develop class consciousness, of organizing the workplace is work and it's not sexy work unlike again running a campaign so i don't know what it's going to take to get out of that and over into just that boring shit that has to happen every day um but that's where it's got to go for there to be a sustainable movement i mean i think the question that jason is asking really demands us to require can we have politics without all the sexy emotional stuff that gets people excited. In other words, can we have politics where we talk about the policy issues, the ramifications of policy making, the ramifications of the, how things affect our quality of life without all of the emotional tethering that comes along that gets people psyched up about you know, all the other aspects. And I think that part of the problem we have in America is that Americans have never been able to deal with the emotional maturity of policy, but yet I always voice the, 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 the actual personality of candidates. In other words, all of our politics are personality driven. Mm -hmm. You know, do you like, you know, people ask the question, do you think you'd be able to have a beer with the president? Who cares if you can have a beer with him? Mm -hmm. You know, and this really start. this is not a new phenomenon. This goes back, I think, starting with the Kennedys, the rise of Kennedy. And it, it really is a way in which media, the advent of television, media, and popular culture fuse this kind of really anti-cerebral look at politics. And I think the only way we, pen we, we penetrate that is that we have to get to a politics of building communities of consciousness around what's affecting people. And that takes an organizing that I think is deeper than we're used to doing. And I don't want to, you know, ring this alarm over and over again about we need we need to organize, but we have to really get beyond the traditional ways in which our media and ideological superstructure get us thinking about the world for us to get out of this problem. I mean, I was you know, I was texting with with Vaughn today, and we were talking about all of the economic data and the crises and whatnot. And I'm like, man, like at a certain point, this stuff all sounds like kabuki theater, man. It's like everyone is spilling all this doom and gloom and this and that. And it's like, it's not even, it's not even analysis anymore. It's like playing off emotions, you know? The new, the new latest, con the new late, latest controversy. But no one wants to talk about how do we solve these problems. Well, I think that's part of the theater that we talk about. And I don't want to sound conspiratorial to the point where I think Joe Biden and Donald Trump are in a room writing a script out. I, I don't believe that at all. 
um, I think for the theater to play out properly, people do have to sit in their ideological boxes. Um, but part of the theater that gets, and this is just my, my opinion, and I'm actually working on this piece that I need to get finished this week, um, is the fact that if you think of, and we were talking about this on Monday on David Feldman's show, Pascal and I every Monday do David Feldman's show. Um, if you think about it kind of like pro wrestling and there's the code of kayfabe, which is never tell people that it's rigged, you know, keep your part, never show people you got are friends backstage, all that stuff. Um, Bernie Sanders in his run, in his initial run, he and Donald Trump, in my opinion, start to break kayfabe. And people are really starting to see how the two party system, um, is a little corrupted because we're still looking at the two party system as good guys and bad guys. I am a Democrat. I'm a virtuous, good guy. I'm a Republican. I am a, a bootstrapping good guy, but the other side is the bad guy. And, and one thing Bernie Sanders talked about was kind of the folly of both parties for a minute um, in 2015 before everything went bad on him. And Donald Trump is doing the same thing, even though he's talking out of both sides of his mouth. I am the Washington outsider that understands how the game is played because I do corrupt it, right? Remember, I think he said that at one point. He goes, I know they're crooked because I pay them. Um, and, on, and on the other side, he's also saying, but put me in office and I'll bring jobs back. Yeah, any idea. Um, but with Donald Trump, he turns it up to 11. The, the character of the leader of the evil empire, in my opinion, while he's in office. And it helps people go back to, you know, for a small moment, people look inside at the machine and like, you know, let's let's break this up. Yeah, we need more public goods governance. Yeah, this is healthcare, everybody should have healthcare. Yeah, F this student debt. And you know, all of a sudden the conversation changes to we have to get the fascists out of the office. And if you think about what happened during the Trump administration in those four years, it's not much different than anything that happened in Reagan's first term. Or any other uh, Republican, I, I would say, you know, unless you disagree, Dan, even with his uh, uh, immigration policies, would you say his immigration policies were worse than Barack Obama? No, I mean, you know, I, I still think Obama, you know, had far more, and obviously he had two terms, but I think even in his first term, if the numbers, if I remember in the numbers correctly, deported more people than Trump did. Um, and, you know, there was certainly like, I, I'm not trying to downplay it. I, I have no doubt that like there were other things during the Trump administration that materially harmed, you know, certain groups of people more like things like the Muslim ban and stuff. But, you know, aggregated on the whole, it's like we're not talking about some massive yeah, political swing. We're not talking about some massive swing. And, you know, border entry is the number you know, of people that are undocumented in the country or the political deadlock around immigration um, and the lack of movement there. All of that shit has been, has been and to this day remains the same. You know, you know some people talk about the, the Supreme Court justices. Um, how do you feel about that, Pascal? Like the Supreme Court justices, like that's a big deal. Like you even hear people, conver- like the conversation goes away from, well, there's always been these people powered movements regardless of who's in the Supreme Court. You know? Was the Warren court the fair and just court of all time? I really, really, really have a problem with the way in which we relegate our belief in justice in a Supreme Court that has always been a reactionary institution, barring the 30 or 40 year period under the Warren court. I mean, Dan is a lawyer. He's trained, you know, just as well as I am. This notion that the Supreme Court is a barometer of justice and liberty and freedom is so ahistorical. When you understand that the majority of this institution's history, this was the court of Plessy versus Ferguson, of Dred Scott, of the Lochner era. And that, you know, the period in which we're talking about when we're going back from Warren to Brown is a short period of top period of time. It's really about Cold War politics. It's really about Cold War politics. It's really about the fact that the United States is competing with the Soviet Union for the hearts and minds of the global South, more so than any kind of belief in a justice system in this country. And what we realize is that once that period of time is over, the United States and the Supreme Court return back to their normal reactive politics. And that's what we've had for 50 years. 
Dan, do you disagree? Yeah. With the no, a hundred percent. Um, and that actually, a lot of that just even goes back to the courts, you know, very origins of trying to cement itself as another place of, you know, place of power within the early, you know, um, early America. But it's like even looking at things, um, like the up and down, you know, it's like, I, it's under potentially under threat again, but like the legalization of gay marriage. It's not like the court was like way out ahead somehow of the populace in terms of the demands and the interest in, you know, legalizing marriage for same sex couples for the LGBTQ plus community. They were way, 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 way behind that. And now we're looking at them possibly pulling that back again. Right. Well, Even though there's broad that. democratic support for that. They, they just, uh, 47 Republicans signed on, what do you call it, um, Tucson? It just happened with gay marriage? I don't know. 47 Am I the only one that reads Business Insider here? I give you guys all the passwords so you guys can have access. What do you call it when you mean something? Codified. Okay. Gay marriage. 47 Republicans voted to codify. Gay they signed on saying that they would codify it? Yeah. Um, In the House? That's interesting. In the house. Uh, gay marriage in the house. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's so <still> ghetto. <laughs> um, no, but, you know, it's and the same thing with Roe, right? It's like, democratically speaking, like, that's that's a shut book. Like, that question has been over for a long time, you know, amongst the, in, in the at least in the court of public opinion. Um, and yet there's an institution that, you know, given a certain positioning can just completely wipe that out. So yeah, I've never, uh, yeah, long since abandoned any notion that there was anything other than status quo power in the Supreme Court. No, and I mean, I, I'm not trying to diminish the fear that people have from the reactionary nature of the court. It's something to worry about. But again, the Democratic Party has acquiesced in this capacity to shut down the court or slow this process down on so many occasions that we can't simply lay this blame on the Republican Party, you know? So at the same time, this is a bipartisan attempt to surrender to the forces of reaction that are bringing the country in the direction that it's going right now. Yeah, I mean, there's just, they've fumbled this, what, three or four times now to even try to slow down this turn um, as the Democratic Party. and. It's not, nothing's going to change there. I just, yeah, nothing's going to change. Do you think that they're actually trying to shut down the, the potential rumblings of rebellion in some ways? I think that, so this was something I was, I was interested in, in sort of positing um, during the immigration piece, sort of talking about some of the recent decisions, because I think that in some ways, having this gridlock around these, um, these, big issues, right, whether that's immigration and the end of migrant protection protocols or Roe, right, it's like we end up debating, um, you know, have, going round and round and round about those issues, and I'm not saying that those aren't important, right, but what it does is it detracts and distracts from any kind of discussion around who gets the final say, right, and it's something that I, th I think just in general, like bourgeois democracy does incredibly well, is it shuts out the question of who, right? Who um, is going to be making the decision, the final decision, and always focuses the question on what, what the decision is and having that debate around there. But again, if it were up to the majority of the American people, this wouldn't even be an issue, right? But because we've deposited that and without question, right? Like there's no questioning of that on the Democrat side. There's definitely no questioning at this point on the Republican side. That's all been deposited in an institution now. That has been for a long a very time. interesting point. I never thought about it. Yeah, it's, it's, it's definitely surrendering all of the question as to who to these, these, these forces of reaction without challenging the, the capacity of us to surrender our, our, our power to these forces in the first place. And our ability to, you know, even ask, even assuming, right, that we, you know, we want some modicum of this under socialism, right, some form of, of representative government, whatever it's going to be, right, that there will be ultimately decision makers. That question of who should always be on the table, right, should always be on the table about 
who is going to be making decisions over what kinds of things get passed politically. And but ultimately, it's a reflection, right, of the, the economic system, which is who has means, who has the final say over the means of production? And it's definitely not the workers. And and by extension, right, that quite, that is completely out of the question to the point that to do otherwise is revolution. What does that look like? What does that look like in terms of our capacity to get Americans and people in general to the point where they are prepared to challenge state and capital to the point where they're seeing options besides bourgeois democracy? Is that something that we can envision or is it something that we on the left are going to be stuck with as a rhetorical device? I, I, I really do think and um, I think that Marx struggled to have a concrete, and everybody who followed after had a concrete vision about a future beyond capitalism, because we don't, there's just no way to know for certain, right, what kinds of institutions we're going to need, what kinds of forms um, of governance, of collectivization we're going to need. But I think what is clear, right, is that there has, no matter what, there will be intermediate steps. And I think one of those intermediate steps, by definition, then, is what you've already mentioned, Pascal, is that organizing piece of developing power in, in a collective sense that isn't deposited solely in a handful of institutions that are not controlled by that collective. Well, representative democracy is, is problematic. Uh, the Democratic-led House of Representatives on Tuesday voted to pass a bill that would enshrine protections for same-sex marriage in a federal law. The bipartisan final vote was 267 to 157, with 47 Republicans joining with Democrats to vote for the bill. It's not clear, however, whether the bill can pass the Senate, where at least 10 Republicans would need to join with Democrats to overcome the filibuster's 60-vote threshold. My question to you all, as we talk about, you know, I do want to pivot into this original question, which was, uh, what is the reserve army of labor and how does uh, immigration and immigration policy work to create this cohort? If one of the big fears after the Alito brief was leaked was they're coming for gay marriage next. And here we have overwhelming support for a bill um, supportive of the institution of gay marriage. Um, do you think we're wrong about this kind of crazy right wing uh, evangelical uh, wing of the GOP? I mean, I, I don't think that I, you know, I think they'll they'll scale back as much as is necessary. But, you know, you do raise an interesting point about the reserve army of labor and um, ultimately how in. And I think it was there was actually a piece in Civilization recently by um, comrade uh, Conrad Hamilton and mm -hmm. sort of lays out kind of a he, he admits that it's a, you know, it's a little bit of a gentle kind of fragile thesis, but that, you know, on the whole, right, the trajectory of immigration has been going down um, as well as has the U.S. birth rate. And one of the fundamental pieces, right, to keep capitalism afloat is this notion of the, the reserve army of labor. You need a group of people who are living in precarity, who you can make demands of that they have no way of pushing back on, at least not readily, and that allows you to maximize the amount of surplus value that you extract from them, right? And so I think one of the things right now that I see going on, right, is that um, there is no, of course, the, capitalism is anarchic by nature, right? There's no plan here for how to navigate the labor shortages now or in the future. So it's always going to be reactive, not always, maybe always reactionary as well, but reactive to whatever present thing is going on. So we have, you know, growing masses of people lined up at the border. Um, that were being held out under the migrant protection protocols of the Trump. Now we're getting those rolled back. So more and more people are going to be let in. But one of the big things that that's going to then have to happen there is that and, and the Supreme Court actually touched on this a little bit, both in oral argument and then in its decision very narrowly to allow Biden to end MPP was is that 
this question of like having to detain all of these people or allow them to come in or forcing them to live in Mexico, like there's still some of that that's not actually clear under the law. So it's going to allow Biden to end it for now, but I guarantee resources are going to skyrocket up for the amount of detention, enforcement, and surveillance attached to um, migration. And I also think that if you look over here on the other side, post row, that similar things, and I think Cuba pointed this out in a, in a prior episode after the Alito opinion was leaked, right? That it's like, with total bans on abortion, you're also going to have enforcement go up, surveillance of women go up, all of those other things that are very similar parallels. So all that to say, right, is that this question of precarity, whether it's coming from the left or the right, it all pays off in the end for keeping that reserve army of labor unstable and unsteady in terms of its footing. Um, and whether, you know, I, I think at the end of the day, capitalism doesn't give a shit if it's a poor white kid that, you know, came out of Mississippi or if it's, you know, one who came up from Central America. As long as the exploitation and the precarity remain in place to continue that exploitation. And so in that sense, again, whether it's a reactionary piece on, on abortion or opening the border um, and then increasing enforcement and surveillance and everything else that's going to come with that doesn't matter. It still pays off in the end for um, purposes of labor. Let's say you, Pascal. I think that, that you know this is a very very interesting conundrum because we're seeing right now with labor right is that labor right now is showing more resilience in its willingness to fight for its demands under COVID than it has been since before COVID. You know the Great Resignation, people are not willing to go back to work under under conditions that they're unhappy with. So what happens is that and not only that there are a lot of job openings. So now what we're finding is that employers are complaining about their in, inability to discipline labor. And what becomes the question is, that is this fear of recession and the uh, inflation going to be used as a weapon to try to discipline labor by forcing job cutbacks as a result of raising interest rates? Because we already heard, as we talked about before on the show, Larry Sumner is talking about the best way for us to avoid this inflation is if we had a couple of years of five to ten percent unemployment but what does that mean what that means is that we find a way to neutralize the power in the hands of labor to keep them under control and keep them in states of precarity so that we don't have to worry about the paying them what they deserve that prices go up well we had a discussion last night on beyond the red zone our bi-weekly sports show check it out uh and one of the things that mac brought up was and i don't know how much baseball fans you guys are but uh, the All-Star Game is, is going on, and there is a restaurant company that does the concessions for Dodger Stadium. Now, just a little context, there's a very large company um, that does most stadiums concessions. That's how they make money. We don't have to really get into the ins and outs of how stadiums make money, but it's not ticket sales. It's, it's concessions and parking, things like that, right? So... Uh, this restaurant company was complaining about wages and they had unionized and they said, we will strike if you guys don't give into our demands and we'll strike the day of the all-star game. And the Dodgers quickly, sure, what do you need? Gave into their demands. And it was viewed as, as, this, as this huge victory and I brought up the fact that <clears throat> where that's good for Dodger Stadium and I guess Chavez Ravine, um, that's a small stadium that really doesn't do as much as most other stadiums that A, hold multiple sports and then hold multiple events. Um, they really have the reserve army of labor working for them. Most of those people are, are making minimum wage and, and aren't unionized and, and don't have the same level of rights. We're seeing a lot of uh, Starbucks unionizing, and you saw how Starbucks is trying to shut that down in uh, major metropolitan areas. 
uh, like L.A. and I believe Philly, they just shut stores down. They were about to vote uh, to unionize. Uh, also, there is a kind of interesting conversation, and uh, I was playing a little bit of devil's advocate on it uh, last night of when we're talking about Starbucks unionizing, which, of course, is a great thing to always see labor understand their power. We're also talking about a wave that a lot of people are riding of a bit of popularity. And you're also talking about a lot of younger people that aren't going to stay in these positions forever. And do they keep this same mentality, especially if they move on to the to another job in the tech sector or somewhere high up in the private sector where now you're not making $10 an hour, you're walking in the door at, at 80 or maybe even $150,000 to start with stock options. Do you still feel the same way about the power of labor and exploitation when all of your needs are getting met and you have a company card than you do when you're having a, a lower level admin yell at you about not putting enough sugars in her already diabetic beverage. Yeah, I mean, those are fair points. And, and I, I, it's telling, right, that we aren't hearing, um, and it, don't get me wrong, I celebrate Starbucks, I celebrate Amazon, you know, like mm -hmm. unionizing, but at the same time, like we're not hearing about, you know, a whole bunch of teachers unions, you know, gaining traction and power across the country. We're not hearing about, you know, the service industry filled, you know, that is filled with migrant workers or the home care industry that is filled with migrant mm. workers. It's not like those crowds are suddenly like, you're not hearing about a bunch of victories there, right? Um, is it the precarity that you speak of? Because also too, when we speak of, and I think maybe I, I didn't get to this point when I'm talking about Starbucks, we're dealing with a younger group of people. And I'm not saying there's something wrong with the youth. And please, I'm not saying these are, these are bad things at all. I, again, we all love these advancements in labor. But when Dan brings up something like home health care workers, which is primarily foreign labor, be it Latin, be it Filipino, right? From California to New York, these are a lot of the people that were dying when COVID was first hitting and Cuomo wasn't uh, doing anything about these, these old folks homes. Pascal has talked about this before, and it definitely, you know, this is why I love doing the show with such a brilliant man. When he brings up the fact that when we think about the, the 20s and 30s, which everyone loves to go back to, this good old time, right? Nostalgia, the, the rear view mirror of nostalgia, of the great old days of when we were 50% unionized. That was in the industrial sector, and that was with a lot of adults, family having adults. This, this movement's a little different. Um, why do you think, Pascal, we don't see, like Dan talks about it, uh, home health care workers with the same level of support than we do with, you know, people in the service industry? Well, I think that what we're seeing is that, right, that those kind of jobs that are high, higher in precarity, that are youth-oriented, that are challenging name brand corporations that are chic and hip create a kind of media buzz when no one knows the name of the major home health care provider that's hiring latinos or filipino women or haitian women in new york city that's not glamorous that's not hip that's not chic you know amazon starbucks there's a certain kind of market cachet to say oh we want to unionize, unionize those big businesses but no one talks about you know the teachers union or, or or those other various types of labor outposts where it would still be even if not more so valuable to have people to be able to organize as well. So I do think that there is a combination of youth fetishization as well as market capture by the name of the businesses involved that gets people to be excited and buzzed about it, even though it is a major advance. And I agree. Unionizing Amazon is a major deal. Amazon is going to be mm -hmm. probably one of the major employers it's in the country, as well as, as well as Walmart. But the thing is, though, we want to press this farther than simply being a niche position for some relatively post-teenager young kids who are just talking about, you know, jobs that are, you know, filling their time between college classes. We want to make this a reality, long-term movement. But this is a start. Yeah, absolutely. And I think too, right, especially in, in the example you gave, Jason, it's like, 
again, immigration status is a great weapon. Um, mm -hmm. It's a great weapon to keep people mm -hmm. from organizing. And that's not just in those sectors. That's at the higher levels, like at the, the tech level where they're bringing, it's you know, tech business. workers from overseas. Those, those visas depend so much on the employer that it is very, very easy to silence any kind of complaint whatsoever from your employees. Um, and so again, I, I think that at the end of the day, right, that, that, that all of those sectors, um, if they can fill those spots with people who, you know, whether that's because they're forced to have children that they can barely, you know, feed and take care of, or if it's because they're migrants with little to no legal status and legal protections, whatever it is, it's a win that way because it's so much easier, at least to a point, right? At some point, I think there is a breaking point, but it, you know, you can tow a pretty hard line in keeping those people in those positions because they have to live not just for themselves, but also for their families. Toussaint, do you have any parting words? Um, I would just like to say um, in regards to Pascal's earlier comment about basically being more rational and less emotional. I'd like to push back against that. Um, I think uh, maybe not emotions, but feelings are important. They do make, there is a distinction between emotions and feelings. Emotions are a bit more removed. So I don't know how you could have a, a movement without a lot of feeling. You can't even make a decision without feelings. So I don't, I don't want that to be, I don't know, poo pooed in any way. Not that that's what you were doing, Pascal, but I felt like that needed to be said. Well, Tucson, I mean, this is why we don't want a woman president. <laughs> I thought you were going to say this is why we don't want a woman on the show. Oh no! Okay. No, no, no. <laughs> we, have, we we need to get more male fans. Oh, my God. Uh, YouTube doesn't have enough male fans. Yeah. Uh, but. Uh, Women in charge, that's why it doesn't work. <laughs> oh, yeah, Dan Mello, baby, I'm telling you. <laughs> so, Pascal, what are you doing after the show gets canceled? <laughs> you want to launch your own? This was revolution? This was revolution, I like that. Pascal will find, you know, Rihanna Joy loves Pascal, and... She said that he can co-host her show anytime. Yeah, he's just waiting for the right time to move. All this is is to set him up for a bigger, a bigger. Move. That's not true at all. I like doing the show with Jason. I just wish that he didn't put his foot in the mouth and jeopardize <laughs> everything we're building. <laughs> That's I mean, that, those you comments know. are like less foot and mouth and more lighting it on fire in public. <laughs> <laughs> foot schmutt. I got another one. <laughs> Uh, I, I do want to say this before we go. Uh, there, a woman actually yeah. helped us out with this. Wow. Yeah, a, a, a woman. Hey. Uh, so shout out to uh, Mrs. Cobra for getting up our new This is Revolution merchandise. Yay. Um Someone, I can't remember who it was, maybe it was Jordan, made a joke about us not having mouse pads and mugs. And I asked Mrs. Cobra if we could have mouse pads and mugs. Why is this not working? Can you share your screen, Pascal? Uh, yeah, your share is. My screen share isn't working for some reason. Oh, son of a bitch. If Gene Bajlan is doing this, I swear to God, I will walk to. There we go. Walk to where you are. Look at that. Can you guys see that? Yes. This is Revolution Cups. Mugs. Are those ceramic or plastic? Uh, I believe they're ceramic. And can you read what the mug is called, uh, Tucson? Mm. It is called This is Revolution. Big black mug. <laughs> ah, 
I'm not talking about me in that name. That's not <laughs> Well, I said in the chat because who doesn't want to hold something big and black when they're getting their day started? Okay. <laughs> oh <laughs> who said that in the chat? That was me. Oh, that's the that is maybe the greatest comment you've ever made. <laughs> See, Pascal has to babysit you and me. <laughs> <laughs> That's what that means. I, I would like to hold big black mugs. You like big black mugs and you cannot lie. I can't. I can't lie. Dan, so listen, man. <laughs> this, this was revolution, I'm telling you. This was revolution. <laughs> the mouse pad is cool, too. Jordan, do not tell people you like your coffee black because your inbox will be so flooded with dicks. Oh, and that's not how you want to spend the rest of your evening. Jordan says she's Family excited Family friendly for show. This is Revolution Podcast. PMC accessories, baby, she says. PMC accessories. So, yeah, so we got we got the, the mug. And I did not tell Mrs. Cobra to call it the big black mug. I'm sure... She did not think, oh, this probably is going to look silly, being that there's two big black guys on the show. Or she has the greatest sense of humor of all time. Either way, shout out to Mrs. Colbert. And as soon as we finally get the final artwork, we will have the... Uh, what do you call that shot, Pascal? Where the one there's all of us like the... it's It's... Marks, <laughs> Lennon, and then it's you and me and Cuba and Gene. What do you Gene call that? What do you yeah, call that picture? There's a name for that picture. I forgot the name of it though. Okay, yeah, that's that's about to be a, a shirt. So we're just waiting for that one. Nice. But uh, I'm excited for that. Dan, thank you so much. Are you joining us for the uh, call in? I am. I am. I gotta hear about this dick carousel. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, there we go. Dan brings it up. So, if get those you patrons, subscriptions in. we'll see you shortly in the champagne room. Notice we actually started on time. Mm-hmm. On time. And we went a little Just, over. No hetero. In the champagne room? Yeah, you're getting you're getting a little bit of champagne right now. Sprinkle. Mm-hmm. So. Toussaint is going to lead us off, and we're going to the champagne room <laughs> to explain to us what is the dick carousel? What does it look like? Can one ride it with friends? Do you ride it alone? Do you need to be this high? Do you exactly? Yeah. These are height requirements. Does Jason make the cutoff? About, we talked he, about height requirements <laughs> off air. Does Jason know. make the cutoff because he's not five ten? Wow. Yep. Five eleven. Anyway, and on that note, <laughs> you can kiss a big black stuff. All right. Thank you guys, and we are, are out. out.